The Parent and Family Resource Pregnancy, Birth and Babies, Part 1 A discussion about pregnancy, birth and babies Applying Divine Truth Principles and Divine Truth Basics to Parenting Self-reflection questions such as Do I want to love? Getting to know yourself, your partner and others Coming to see how family dynamics are created by the parents and how children are reflectors of what is happening in the family dynamic. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 5th of March, 2021, at 12pm, Part 1. Hello and welcome. This presentation is on pregnancy, birth and babies. The presentation can um, apply to new parents who are, are thinking of are thinking of even having a child, those who are already pregnant or have had a newborn, also to adoptive parents and to foster carers or any anyone really who's a guardian of a child. You might even be semi-child yourself and be looking after a, a little one, maybe you know that one of your siblings or someone else. Um, I know there's a lot of children looking after children at this time in, the, in their lives and in a way you're taking on the role of a parent and this might have some interesting um, principles that you could apply to loving your, your siblings or also loving the, the new child or the new soul that you have um, has incarnated into to your, to the world and who will become part of your life. I thought to start at the beginning and that is you know before we become a parent in previous videos, I've covered some information about the role of a parent from God's perspective. In this one, I'll be talking about some of those things, but also about maybe where you're currently at. Um, and that will be the focus for you to explore and find out. Now, if you're just thinking of having a child, and I, I know that um, for myself, I thought about having children, not necessarily seriously of wanting to have a child, but from quite a young age, actually. Um, from my mid-teens, I was already thinking, yep, at some point I'd like to have a baby and I'd like to have children. So in a way, you know, depending on if you're even contemplating children, this resource might apply to you no matter really what your age is. When you haven't had a child or looked after a child full time, sometimes we have, I suppose, fantasies about what it's going to be like or we have ideals and concepts or um, things of how we would like it to be or how we think we're going to be. And I found personally that I was a pretty self-absorbed person and quite caught up in just my own everyday life. I liked the idea of it, but I didn't really understand the practical reality of having a child. And you can't know that really until you care for a child or have a child. And you won't know that because you haven't had the experience. People tell you a whole lot of different things. I think the most useful thing that I would, in reflection, would have liked to have known personally is that I, what I feel, think, uh, believe, anything that has happened to me in my past, all of that, will be exposed, uh, it will be if you don't have children too, but children almost accelerate all of, like they, they basically throw into, for me it just threw into orbit and I've talked to a number of mothers uh, and fathers and it sort of like just seems to kick start all of this stuff that you've been sort of avoiding or have been able to avoid because you know, you haven't been sleep deprived and you haven't had to look after anybody else and you can just leave when you want to. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of us, I'm not saying everyone, but a lot of us are very self-absorbed people. You know, it's sort of about our life. We're not too concerned about the lives of others. Or if we are concerned about the lives of others, it's often for what we get out of, of being involved in someone else's life. So the world kind of revolves around us, our decisions, what we want, how we want life to be. I would have liked to have known that it's worth finding out what I really am like before I have children. And that means like, looking at myself and finding out warts and all. So being really honest about who am I, what do I really love, what do I really not love, you know, what are my addictions, meaning what sort of demands and or what, what do I use, what methods do I use in order to get away 
from feeling uncomfortable or feeling bad things or, you know, what am I really like when I'm really tired? Uh, what emotions am I denying? Like, how do I really feel about things? And that can be anything. How do I really feel about being a woman? How do I really feel about being a man, if you're a man? How do I feel about women? How do I feel about the opposite gender? What are my beliefs about children and the role of children? What are my beliefs about being a parent? What do I think I'm going to get out of being a parent? Why do I even want to be a parent? What's truly driving this desire of mine to have a child? Is it to love that child and to teach and educate them about the wonders of the universe? Is it to help to make transparent like God's laws and the way that the universe works and to really give the gift of love to these children? Or, you know, this child or children, depending. Or is it to get something? Is it because I want to feel like a real woman or I want my family name to continue or I want, uh, you know, I want a son so that he can grow up, you know, just like me, his father, or I want children so that they can do all the things that we as parents never did. Um, or I want children, you know, there's so many reasons why you might want children. And if you examine most of what I've said, bar the wanting to love ch children be just for who they are and help educate them about all the wonders in the universe and about God and our creator and all these just wonderful things that the world has to offer if we understand and educate ourselves, if we have any other reason for having children that is not about love, we're not in harmony with love anymore. Now, you might have all kinds of contrasting and conflicting, um, you know, feelings. And we do. We, we're complex characters, a lot of us, and we have a lot of different things going on at, all at one time. But figuring that out before you even get pregnant, very helpful. Just to know where you're at and who you really are and giving up this facade or this pretense of who you are. That can be very challenging for most of us because we're holding on to an illusion of ourselves in order that most often we don't want to see ourselves as we really are and we want to feel feeling some feelings about what's going on inside of us. But it is knowing what you're really like and what you really feel about things will be very helpful when you have a child. Now, if you're already pregnant and you have a child already in, inside of you, you know, as a woman and you're carrying it and, you know, and your partner, you're probably going through a whole lot of stuff, excitement, like a myriad of feelings, like, you know, I remember being really excited, but also a lot of fears coming up. Um, you know, it's unknown. You don't know what's going to happen with your body, as this is as a woman. Uh, the man, I've noticed a lot of men feel like sometimes quite helpless or they sort of, uh, you know, some men get quite jealous of their wives carrying a baby. Um, they also feel like they're no longer the center of their relationship, so now there's a problem. You know, there's, there's a lot of different feelings happening here. Some men also feel like they need to do more to support the woman, and the woman just wants to be looked after. Some men just vacate because it's a woman's job, and they just need to deal with it. Like, there's all kinds of different emotions, and it'll be different for each person. If you are carrying a child, you can start looking at all of these dynamics in your relationship between you because all of those are going to play out and they're going to affect the relationship that you have and that you start creating with the children or the child who's coming into your world, um, into your life, not into your world because it's God's world, but into your life. And, you know, it's worth as partners discussing openly and honestly about these different things and letting yourself feel about them. So one of the greatest gifts that you can give your baby is to feel how you feel. Now, some women have expressed to me how they're worried that if they feel their feelings, then somehow that will hurt the child. No, feeling your feelings, truly letting your feelings flow. And, you know, in pregnancy, a lot of people are told, well, you're just more hormonal and you're more emotional. Be emotional. Like, you know, let yourself have the feelings as they come up. And the more you feel, the more you release, the more you let go of, then the less that baby is going to absorb of all of those unhealed feelings. The more that you can be transparent and honest with your partner, the more you can figure out all the gendered issues and dynamics you have. And, you know, this is, if you're carrying a baby, you probably might have more motivation to do it. You can do all of this before you have a child. Uh, it's just a reflection process of finding out more information about yourselves as parents. Both parties, so the man and the woman in this relationship, or you may be, um, you know, both a female couple and have a parent, uh, be, you know, a, a unit of 
two women um, who are one of you is having a child, or both of you might be having a child, I don't know. Um, or you may um, be two men who are going to be having a little newborn baby and who, there's so many different ways of having children now and different combinations. So, but it's worth, even if you are in a same-sex relationship, it's worth looking at your beliefs also about the opposite gender because if you have an opposite gender baby, all of those feelings are going to come up and be exposed as well in your relationship. So it's worth opening up a dialogue and a discussion and the beauty of having a partner in your relationship is that you've got someone who you can discuss these things with and nut things out with. And if you're a single parent or you, you know, you're just uh, on your own, you don't have to have a partner. It's just a lovely opportunity for you to get to know your partner more if you are in a relationship. If you're not, and depending on the circumstances that has caused that, you can reflect about you know, how you feel about being on your own and what's happened with, uh, between you and your partner and what were the issues that caused you not to actually be together or maybe you just had a one night stand and or you know and, and you don't want the father to be involved or maybe you had a one night stand and you know you don't know that now the lady's pregnant you know and you've actually got a child on this earth you know it's possibility like the amount of sleeping around that well you know has started happening I know my generation and in the next generation there's a lot of babies who have been born and or who are um, conceived, a lot of now with abortion and, you know, things, uh, well, with abortion, a lot of lives are also, you know, there's a lot of murder happening as well on a greater scale. And I'd take that into consideration as well if you're thinking of, of aborting your child, that, you know, you, it is a soul. It's not a physic, just because it's physically um, not necessarily completely formed, there's a soul there. And that soul actually is, if you abort a child, is cause to go to the spirit world and it's a very um, hard road for that soul because they've had no self um, actualization to find out about themselves on the earth and they have to be looked after specifically sort of by a team of people in order that they can um, grow and develop and a lot of them feel very very sad they have a lot of hard emotions to deal with in order to to work through and I just say there's more information on the Divine Truth site on abortion specifically and miscarriage. And all of those things that might happen, you know, if you lose a baby. And I'll talk more in depth maybe about some of those things, you know, as examples as we go through these videos. But they're all because of certain emotions in the parents. So miscarriage is a lot about the demand of the mother or, and, and or I suppose some of the father, but particularly the mother, um, to have a child and for the ch child to fulfill a role in their life. And it's just so the demands are very, very overwhelming um, for the child and so the child, it doesn't come to term um, to be born. So I realise that some of the things I say here are going to be probably quite confronting. I just suggest that you feel your, your feelings about them and search and seek more information um, to find the truth on these matters. And the more truthful you are with yourself and the more that you desire to have truth about what's really happening in your life, I suggest that you will find those truths. Again, on abortion and miscarriage, go to the Divine Truth website. There's some really good um, resources on, on exactly what happens and what's the reasons why those things are happening as well. So what I'm encouraging to do by um, suggesting all these different questions and things to find out is really to firstly find out about yourself and who you are and what your real beliefs and feelings and thoughts are. And because we're talking about parenting, I'm focusing you specifically on your beliefs, feelings, thoughts, and ideas about children, the role of children, parents, the role of um, parents, gender dynamics, and what you believe the role of a man is, and what you believe the role of a woman is, uh, the reasons why you even want children. There's a lot of children without parents who could do with a very, you know, they'd, they'd thrive in a loving home, yet there's this very big feeling of wanting to own a child and that's why you know there's IVF and trying to get pregnant and all of these things like the reason that a woman doesn't get pregnant and or a man is impotent and can't you know and, and can't create well you can't create the conditions I suppose and the physical process in order that a baby can develop inside you know a womb there's emotional reasons for that I'm suggesting to be very honest with yourself about what your beliefs and demands and thoughts and expectations and feelings are towards children and having children. 
All of these things can happen way before you actually have a child. And then they can continue through as you, as you, ha you know, as you are pregnant, through the pregnancy and also afterwards. For me personally, honestly, I didn't, I didn't even know about anything or have even a thought to do any self-reflection or think about any of these things until after our second child it was only when I, just when I was pregnant with my, our third child that I actually um, had, I came to hear the teachings of divine truth and started to reflect on my own reasons of why I felt like I wanted to have children and why it was so important and this need in me and my family actually for a woman to have children and to be a, to be a real woman and to be validated as a woman. So that's just one thing. There'll be so many different things you'll discover about yourself. I really encourage you to let yourself be very, very, very honest and let yourself feel about what it is. A, a friend of mine recently had a baby and obviously was pregnant and she described how she had a scan, like an ultrasound, and actually found out the sex of her baby and that she found that was really beneficial for her because it brought up immediately she knew that she was carrying a boy. It brought up all these emotions she has about men and her beliefs about men and um, some really like, you know, um, emotions that she was quite surprised that she had towards men. But it enabled her to sort of work through or at least acknowledge that she had those emotions and to feel some of those things before the baby was born, which is going to help baby so much because little bubs who's inside of you is absorbing every single thing that's going on. Um, it's feeling all of your feelings, all of your emotions, all of your belief systems, everything that's happening, it's absorbing emotionally um, into its soul. And so it's going from this pristine, beautiful soul and it's coming down and basically being indoctrinated into wherever you are at in your family. And whatever soul condition you and your husband have or partner have, that is going to influence and impact on the child. So the more that you can work through and release any of these emotional impediments that you have towards love and truth and, you know, the, and the beliefs, the false beliefs you have that are out of harmony with love, the more you can release of those and the more you can get an education in love, it will stand you in good stead as you then uh, continue the journey of being, becoming and being a parent. Um, now pregnancy, so the same thing can happen in pregnancy, we sort of diverged a bit if you chose not to have a pregnancy and you terminated a child. If you did that then there's going to be a whole lot of emotions that come up around that and I really encourage you to feel those and be real about them and give yourself the time and space to go through those emotions because that will help you a lot and then you know you may choose to not have children after that or choose to have children in a different manner um, than you did previously. The experience of having a child in your life, I feel, is a, a huge privilege and also one you're getting to know a whole new, brand new soul. Or even if you've adopted as a tiny little toddler or you've come in to look after the, you know, the care of a, a, become the guardian of a small child. There's so many wonderful experiences and it's like I, I know for myself and I observe other mothers and fathers who, when their baby's first born, it's like everything's the first time. It's like all new and everything's the first time it's happened. And there's something very, very special about knowing another soul from the moment that it's incarnated until it, you know, until it, 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 well, if you have a good relationship, you could know for the rest of your existence. If you don't form a very good, close, you know, connected relationship with the child, then it might only be for a few years or, you know, however long, um, you know, until they choose to leave your life, depending on what their choices and decisions are. And that's, I suppose that's where the love comes in. Children aren't there for our pleasure or our gratification or for us to like to do what we want. Um, I feel like they're just coming in to become self-aware and find out about their own soul and find their own soulmate and learn about the world and the universe and then they'll go off and become their own passions and you know really if they embrace their own passions and desires they'll live their own full wonderful lives. I feel that most parents don't feel that way towards the children. We're very invested in the children. We have a lot of um, feelings of what children should do. We impose our beliefs upon children. We, you know, and you can say that you don't. You can say you don't because I have said on certain circumstances, I wouldn't do that. I'd never do that.
The reality is that I have, because if I have a feeling or a belief in me, I'm already imposing that on the child automatically without saying a word. Whatever is in my soul is, you know, whatever I accept or I reject or what I'm not okay with or what I am, the child is feeling that and already responding. Children are just these wonderful, they're a barometer in a family. You know, they're, they're able to show us once they come into the world. On their birth, they can show a family exactly what is loving and what's out of harmony with love. And if we as parents are humble enough to accept that feedback and actually do something about it and change ourselves to become a more loving human, then that will create a lovely environment for a child to grow up. We can also say, no, we don't want to blame the child and that makes it quite harsh and, and we become unloving towards the child and they'll have some pain to go through in their future at some point in order to release that and to work through the issues of, of what, we, what we, the parent, created or did to them. And that's the reality of how it is. The thing as a parent that you, I think there's all these, I'm saying these opportunities. The thing that I would have loved to know myself is one, to come to know and understand myself and my partner intimately, like really, really know them and know myself and understand the reasons why I do things, understand my motivation, my intentions, all of those different things, understand where I actually am and measure, am I really a loving person or am I not? What are the addictions and codependences I have with my partner? Where am I at in regards to love? Do I want to love? Do I want to become a more loving person? Uh, do I actually want to love other people or do I just want to be selfishly loved, you know? Um, if I want to just be loved and it's a selfish desire on my part and it's a selfish motivation to have children and it's one of the ones that I had was to avoid my own feelings of feeling unloved you know that's a very selfish motivation but if I'd been um, you know I had the opportunity before having children to actually figure that out and work that out for me I was you know too selfish to do so and it wasn't until after having children and after quite a lot of pain and when my life felt really hard that I went, okay, I need to do something. And I could also see the negative impact I was having on the children about how I wouldn't have at the time said it was unloving because I didn't have that language to use. But I could see that, no, what I'm doing is not working here. And I could see the results in the ch ch children. Like I did um, hit our daughter at once and I could see that, like just the pain in her. And, and immediately I felt like, why did I do that? Like she didn't even do anything. I was just so angry and wanted to like teach her a lesson. And that, that's a very unkind thing to do. It was the one and only ever time that I did it because I was like, no way, I'm not doing that. And, you know, that's the on-flow effect of multi-generations of people, you know, of parents saying, oh, no, it's fine. You know, it's fine to hit a child if they do the wrong, th if you think they did the wrong thing. What I came to see very rapidly is that a child, particularly a very small child, it's not doing the wrong thing. It's just reflecting its environment and it's something for us, the parents, to feel. And that's why you'll hear me saying so often and so much, feel what you feel. Come to understand and know what you feel for yourself, not what others feel, not what you think you should feel, what you actually feel. And some of those things, you are not going to be very nice. And some of those things you're gonna to wanna to judge. And some of those things are gonna be downright like evil and have evil intentions and motivations. And it's worth knowing that about yourself because if you don't know it, you can't change it. That's one principle. If you don't know, you can't do anything about it. So it's better to know so that you have an opportunity to do something about it. And that's better for your partner and also the child, any child in your care. Because if your partner knows the truth about you and what's really happening, then your partner can make decisions. And it's very important to, to have that, not withhold information or not say things just because you're afraid of losing your partner or you're afraid of your partner's, you know, what they're going to think of you or feel about you. It's worth facing that up and dealing with that and, get, you know, working through that at the beginning of a relationship rather than way down wet like the road when you've got, you know, maybe, you know, a child or multiple children or you've had, you know, all entwined and interwoven with all of, all kinds of different things that happen once you enter a relationship. Uh, I mean, in my opinion now, from my, uh, in, in hindsight, it's just best to just get it all out in the open, right at the beginning, to be truthful, transparent. Everyone then knows where they stand. Everyone can make decisions. If you are humble and you actually allow yourself to feel whatever you feel, 
You'll feel your way through anything that happens. And God never, ever gives us more than we can ever handle. So that's a very loving provision. It means that we can handle a lot more than we often think we can. And that may, you know, the more we let our emotions flow and experience it emotionally and release any pain that's happening and experience and express the, any pleasure that we have, the more um, smooth our lives are, the happier that we'll be, the more joy we can have in our life, the more love we can give to others and the more love we can accept and receive. So there's a lot of stuff in it. I mean, that's a long, long sort of way, but I want to give sort of some extensive examples and, and different ways of just encouraging you and suggesting to let yourself feel and like come to know where you're at right now, what your beliefs, feelings, thoughts about children and relationships and gender and all these things are. Very beneficial um, exercise to do. Uh, some self-reflection there before you have children. Now, if, like me, you already had children or you too self-absorbed to actually even do that or even think that you've got a problem, which many of us believe, then when you're pregnant, often um, I've noticed that, or, you know, often I've noticed that a lot of things come up suddenly when you're pregnant. Like, you think you're okay, you think you got things handled, you think you're in control, but there's so many things you can't control and all your body starts changing so there like as this is for the woman then there's lots of things that go on there but also if, if you've got a partner when you know your, your partner's body starts changing there's a lot of feelings that come up for the partner too in, in many ways like some men really love um, their their partner when when their um, body starts changing and I, I suppose if you're in a same-sex marriage I, I, I don't have any experience with that but you may love the, the change in the body and, and it might also be a, sort of, I suppose, vicariously uh, going through the process of, of your partner being pregnant too and it'd be fascinating and it's quite a marvel what happens to the female body when these things happen. I also know some, I've heard of some men who are quite disgusted about what happens to a woman's body and these are other things that are going to then be exposed in the relationship. To me, it's better to discuss those things, not in a nasty way or a pulling down way, to be frank and honest and have a conversation about what's really going on between you because what your partner and you are feeling, that's going to be felt by the other party regardless if they're aware of it or, or not. And these things, it's like being truthful and transparent. The beauty of it is, is that things are said aloud, things are expressed, there's no covert operation going on. It's simple, it's factual, it's all out there. And, you know, instead of making underhand comments, have a really, like, loving, respectful, you know, conversation with each other about what's going on and let yourself feel about how you feel about what's going on. It's going to help you to be more, like, to be closer, more connected. Um, it might also feel, bring up some really strong feelings and you might feel all kinds of different things, like, shame, revulsion, like pain about it, um, you might feel judged, you might feel all kinds of things. Let yourself feel all of those. If you work through them, they will come to an end at some point. You know, the more you let yourself release them, the faster they'll come to an end and you'll have a new feeling about your, yourself or about your partner. But if you don't feel them, if you don't acknowledge them, and look, even if you don't have the conversation with your partner, be at least honest with yourself about how you feel about them and work through those issues. Your partner is going to feel what you feel about them. They are. So you can't pretend that they're not. There might be some situations where, I mean, I'd encourage any partnership, if you really want a close connected relationship, I do encourage you to be honest and speak about everything and, and discuss it and not be unkind to each other, but from a place of loving the other person. And that takes some soul development to do. I know at first I had no desire. I want to, well, not sure. I just had, I was conditionally love, you know. And, and is that really love? No, I didn't really want to passionately love my, my, my partner. I wanted him to do a whole lot of things for me. And I was happy to do a lot of whole, like, whole lot of things for him in a barter situation in order to get things. And he wanted to get things from me. That's not real pure love. And the fact is, is that if that's what the relationship is based on, in my opinion, you might as well be frank and honest and open about that from the beginning. You can then make some decisions of, and if one party goes, you know, I really want to actually have a, a more loving relationship. All of that unloving stuff, all that barter, all of that addictions, all of those things are going to have to be broken down before 
you know, a, a relationship can be built from a loving foundation. That's the way it is. That's the facts. And you can, like, pro, you know, prolong that process and be in denial for a lot longer, or you can kind of just get down to business and sort of start now and work it out. And I feel that before you have a child, it's probably the best time to do it. But most of us are pretty self-involved and selfish and don't really do a lot until we're sort of forced into the situation, sadly, or until the pain becomes so great, you know, the pain pleasure scale, you know, when something's like kind of, there's not any pain, sometimes the pain has to get greater than, you know, our fear or our, our addiction before we're actually going to do anything about it, sadly, but true. So the point is, is to be truthful, transparent with your partner before and after pregnancy. And if you're not going to be truthful and transparent with your partner, at least be truthful and transparent with yourself. It is loving to be truthful with your partner. And if you can't discuss everything in all matters, you're never going to be truly close and connected. Right? You're not. Um, and by discussing issues with one another, even if they feel like they're really hard issues, it will expose a whole lot of beliefs and emotions and feelings that you have inside of yourself. And it's an opportunity for you to grow, for both parties to grow. As I was saying just about you know, pregnancy, it's this transformation of a body. It's a whole new experience if it's the first time you've ever done it. It's never happened before, so it's something new to learn more about yourself. And Oh, for both parties, that's for them, for you know, for the partner and for the the woman going through through the the experience. Yeah, there's so many different things that change, you know, like and so many things that happen. Like your body expands and it widens and it stretches and you become more stretchy and you have different feelings. And I noticed I thought about different things than I ever had. There was a lot of fears exposed and anger and grief exposed. I actually remembered things from my own childhood that I'd been in denial of for many, many, many years. And then as you get closer to, to having the baby, then a whole lot of feelings come up about, and depending on your past experiences or the amount of fear that you have or the amount of rage that you have in you about you know, having a child and nurturing a child and giving to a child and all of these kind of things, also will depend on how your birth goes. And I know for myself, I, I had fears about that my body wouldn't be able to, like I wouldn't be able to do it. I didn't know whether I, like it would work. I'd come from a home birth. I was a home birth baby and um, I'd experienced my little brother actually being born at home. So it, like I trusted the process of birth that you could birth very easily. It wasn't like your body just naturally takes over and does it. It's, it's going to expel a baby if you like. And your body's designed to do that. A woman's body's designed to do that. So I kind of knew that, but I still had emotional fears that maybe I couldn't do it, that maybe I wouldn't be as good as my mom. Maybe I was going to be, you know, like maybe what if something went wrong? And it was my feelings about what if it went wrong. So I did quite a lot of crying and, um, you know, worrying. And, and the worry was just to avoid actually feeling some fears and crying. And But in hindsight, I can see, and for the third child, I just let myself feel. I just, when I had those fears, like I didn't have those same fears because I'd already had a baby by the third child. But for the first child, naturally, I did that. I actually cried about it and I did talk to my partner about it. And he was very reassuring. And I feel like instead of reassuring, a better option would have been just to keep discussing those fears and letting me feel whatever I felt about them and letting me, you know, have that experience of what was going on. So yeah, that comes, you know, there's different sort of things that you might never have experienced or even thought about that start coming up as you get closer to actually giving birth. Depending on your situation as well, then there's other, other things that come up. So for me personally, like actually making a decision, am I going to have, it ended up that I could only have a hospital birth because there's no home birth, mid, birth midwives in the area for, the first, for our first and second child. And I really wanted a home birth. I personally was far more afraid of hospitals than I was of having a child at home. Uh, as an anecdote, I also, uh, my ex-husband and his uh, mum and dad also lived on the farm that we, that we were on or the property we were on and they had sheep and cattle and so they often were delivering baby lambs and baby cows. So in my head I was like, well you guys are delivering like baby animals, mammals all the time. What's the difference with me? Why can't you just like deliver at home? And uh, as my ex-husband and I have discussed, you know, he had fears about what would ha what if something went wrong and how he'd feel and 
that you know he, he didn't really trust that process and he, he didn't trust me either or, or that I'd be able to do it and all these different things and I wanted him to make certain decisions for me that I didn't have to make so you know I went along with different things too so we both had these sort of demands and expectations of each other or these fears or different things and if we'd been more humble and just worked through them and felt through them I think we probably would have attracted a home birth midwife and had maybe a different experience but it was what it was and I got to work through a whole lot of things because I created the experience that I created and that was that's something that's well worth taking into consideration. Your pregnancy and your birth, and that goes for both partners, is your collective creation. So, and when it comes to the birth part, that is the woman, like really, like a, the man does have an influence there, but it is the woman's body and you choose and you create the type of birth that you have. And that's what you want. It's exactly what you want is what you'll have. The more you can release certain feelings out of yourself, the easier and quicker and more natural and smoother your birth's gonna go. And that's a fact, like it's a fact. I've, I've watched births happen and I can see how a woman creates what happens. Sometimes there are physical things and that is again, like depending if you've had the physical issue from when you were like conceived or you know when you were born, and that is an, an intergenerational attraction or like a, a something that's happened due to your parents' issues that, that cause that deformation in, the physical, in your physical body. But if it's something that's happened, you know, as you grew or whatever, well, that is an attraction for you. And if you didn't work through the issues, then that issue would have, you know, happened. And, you know, I'm, I believe that all disease is because we are resisting and shutting down emotions. And if we actually were more humble and released emotions, then often illnesses or ailments or diseases or issues in our bodies would be healed as well. Depending on how far the body, the physical body has deteriorated, depends on how, how easily it can heal. There's a lot, man, there's just so much I could say about that and I don't want to go on a tangent in that. I just want to be clear that the, the birth and the experience of pregnancy that you have is directly related and influenced by your emotional you know your soul condition and your emotions and the more that you can release and the more honest and truthful and desire to love you have the better that your birth and pregnancy will go so yeah so via, during pregnancy obviously lots of different things can happen and um, I won't go into heaps of details there but again just anything that happens like as I said it's all new it's unknown and there's something lovely about that I know that women who want to control things a lot or men who want to control things, they find that process quite confronting and quite hard. I found it just fascinating. Like I was like, wow, check out what's happening to my body and look what's going on and look how big. I always had some body issue issues come up, like of feelings of being huge and being fat and massive and things like that. So those were things to feel about. I also found it quite amazing how like your breasts expand. Like I went from like having, you know, A, <laughs> a size bra to having like double D bra by the time um, we had a baby. So that was quite an experience to have breasts. And also like milk coming out of, of your, your breast when you breastfeed. And that's quite a fascinating thing that your body actually produces nourishment for this little person who's coming into the world. Like you don't need any external thing in order to, to feed. It's like you've got the food, you've got everything you need for that baby's um, welfare. And that's a pretty incredible design. Like, it blows my mind of, of the birthing process. It is amazing, like the pregnancy process and birthing. Like, amazing that literally the female body can grow another human inside it. Like, how amazing is that? And we don't even understand how it happens. Like, sure, we've got the physical aspects, but how does the soul, you know, get in there and all this kind of stuff? So there's so many things that people don't know and don't understand and really we're clueless humans. I think we can know more and there's, as I said in previous videos, uh, you can't, God can answer any question so we do have the capacity to know things but we need to have the capacity and the soul development which means to be, to be developed more in love and understand love more because the more love you have the more you can understand and know. Anyway, and that's a bit of an aside. So yeah, pregnancy and birth, what you've got is what you want. Um, that might feel confronting to you but that's my experience is that, and also I feel like it is a, a truth. We create 
you are creating what you want right now. Which the beauty of that is if you can see what you have right now and you can understand in yourself what has contributed to the creation of what is created right now means you can change it and you can do something different. And that's a very important thing to understand. So what you have right now is what you want. But if you understand why the cause of why your life is like it is, what is contributing, and it might be a number of things that are contributing to how it is, and you understand what that is, then you have the power to change it. And you do on your own. So you don't need anyone else. Um, I do find a relationship with God very helpful, but you can do this and change yourself if you understand what is truly going on, if you understand the cause of what's causing where you are at right now. That's why it's so good to understand and know yourself and be truthful. Now, once you understand the cause, now you can change it. That is an emotional soul-based process, and it will not change if your soul doesn't change. That's a fundamental principle. Only, the only real change is soul-based emotional change. It won't change otherwise. You can try physically, you can think it, you can use positive affirmations. None of it's going to work unless you make a soul-based change. So again, back to how important feeling through your own emotions are, how important it is to be truthful with yourself. How, you know, and having a desire to love is going to help you to, to work through various different things. If you just have a desire to be loved, you'll just be a big demand on your environment and lots of people in the end will probably not want to hang around you much because you're so demanding that they do all these things for you and you don't want to do much for them or you only do it if there's a barter system. So you'll attract people who, who are happy to do that. It's not a very fulfilling or, and it doesn't make for close connected relationships. All right, so we've sort of discussed a bit of pre-pregnancy and things you can do to understand and know yourself, which why I suggest that is to, it will stand you in good stead for when you actually have your children or have any children that come through you. You can notice I'm saying, have your children. They're not your children, they're God's children. Um, they're merely your, you know, someone who you're going to be the guardian of and a potential educator. Of, well, you're going to educate them. It's just whether or not you choose to educate them in a loving manner or an unloving manner. And that will choose on, depend totally on your choice as a parent. There's a lot of responsibility as a parent. I don't think that many of us consider the responsibility that we actually have. Sometimes we do once we're confronted with certain things that happen in our lives. But many of us just think that it's really the child's problem. And I'm here to say that no, we set up and we create the initial, we create the environment that a child comes into. And what a child is like, particularly when, you know, is, is our creation. When they're very small, they're just reflecting us, our unhealed emotions, and us meaning, you know, the parents. Um, I kind of say us and we, meaning you the audience and myself, and I'm talking about collectively as parents. So I'm sort of using those personal pronouns. And when I say you, I'm talking about the royal you, you specifically, me, and everyone else in the world. So yeah, the collective um, emotional condition creates, you know, and the environment that that child comes into, that influences a child. And I feel like as children grow, I've created things in them directly. I've created certain feelings in them, certain ways, and they act out of those now. Their dad has created certain things in them and they act out of them now. Um, the dad and I together have created certain things in them, either by allowance or by active um, encouragement. You know, we have created certain things in those children and, and, to, and that are unloving, they're out of harmony with love. Now, if they were all loving things, there'd be no problem with it. We'd be great parents. But we're not. <laughs> we didn't do, we didn't choose to love the children. We, we wanted a lot of things from the children and we had a lot of high demands and a lot of expectations and a lot of um, shutting them down emotionally and a sh shutting them down their desires and teaching them untruths and teaching them things that were unloving. That was our responsibility, me and my partner's responsibility. We did that. And the only, you know, there's compensation for that for, via God's laws. But I also now feel after, you know, I think really for the last sort of five years, I've been really sincere about this process. It's taken me 11 years sort of consistently getting, doing things um, and sort of growing and learning and coming to understand things. But I really feel like the last five years I've had this real feeling of like, no, 
you know, this growing feeling of like, I need to correct the damage I have done. I must correct the damage I have done because I can see the wrong that I've done and I can see how it's affecting the children's lives. Like they're becoming young adults and they're acting on things that, you know, are going to affect their lives for the rest, you know, for the rest of their existence unless they make a different choice. So while they're still in our home and when my, in my home, because my uh, ex-husband and I are separated or are divorced, we don't live together anymore. So while they're in my home, I still have the opportunity to, to educate and to re-educate and say, look, what I taught you is wrong, guys. It was not loving. And this is what is loving. And then they at least have the exposure to make a choice of what they want to do now. So I feel that's very important. I've sort of um, headed off into the future. So let's go back to pregnancy and birth. So say now you got through pregnancy and we're talking about getting to the end of your pregnancy and other feelings coming up and needing to work out about what kind of birth you know you want and are saying that you create the exact birth that you want. So you can think it, but again, get real with what your real feelings are. And... Um, it's quite important, like, you know, the fact of, you know, labours that are really long and drawn out, you know, that's a lot of control in a woman and her not wanting to, like, not giving the baby permission to come and to not be birth, to not be born. And it, there's, there's a lot of different feelings in a woman that are going to prevent or make problems during the labour and the birth. Something to remember is that the female body is designed to have a baby. It's designed to, for a baby to grow, and it's designed to birth a baby. Naturally, completely naturally. And the body, if, you, if you've ever been experienced of birth or um, been, you know, had the privilege of actually being at someone else's birth, the amazing thing about it is that the body is just slowly opening. It's just going through a process. So you have what they call like pre-labor, and then you have like active labor, and then you have, um, you know, transition and birth. And that. Um, anyway, I'm not like up with all the technical information, but the pre-labor is sort of like the, it can sometimes last for weeks or days, you know, where the body's just like slowly, slowly di opening and your cervix is dilating, which means that just opening and just making room so that it's big enough that the baby's head can fit through. And that's like just opening, 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 opening. Once then your cervix gets to about four centimeters, um, then between four and 10 centimeters, that's sort of what they call active labor. Now, if you're in a hospital, if you don't try, um, if you don't progress, sort of, basically, it's about. I think, from what I understand, it's approximately like a centimeter, sort of an hour, or they have basically a timeline of how you should be dilating. And if you don't do that, then they often there's interventions, and they will, you know, try and help baby come. Often for the safety of the baby, sometimes out of fear of different things, but. You don't need to have all of those inter interventions if you deal with why you are not wanting your baby to come out like really it sort of feels that simple to me because your body wants to expel the baby when babies you know when you, you it's like the body if you just left the body and there was no emotional um, interference the body would just um, open it would go through its process it would just slowly open at a speed that was you know um, able to to be to be done by 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 the body now I've heard of women who have literally had a baby within two hours the whole thing like done and the baby comes out and they've really trusted their bodies. They know that they have birth. They've literally had birth at home um, because they didn't make it to the hospital. They weren't worried about it. They didn't have any fears about it. They didn't have really any preconceptions about it. And the baby could just come out. So that is a possibility. It's possible. Most people's labor is longer than that. And, but the process of actual, the physical opening of the body, that's a natural re response. And it's the body's design. The body is designed to do it. So your body wants to do it, it's doing it. And even when you have all these emotions going on, your body's still opening up. What I have found via my own experience and also having the privilege of um, having uh, the experience of actually being at a friend's birth as well, well, friend's baby's birth, um, and, her, and their experience is that they created, she, she created the birth that she wanted and she was controlling, she didn't really want to have, baby. she had a, a lot of feelings, but her resistance and her anger at actually allowing the birth process to happen for all kinds of different reasons, she had like all these different things going on, that actually prevented it. It made it exceptionally slow labor and it prevented baby from just, from just coming out. And it was just so fascinating to watch the process of how 
you know, like every woman's body is, every woman is capable, competent, their body's already made to do, to have a baby. We're designed to do that. But our emotions cause the experience that's had. It actually influences so much, like what happens. It stops a labor, it starts a labor. It, like some labors I was reading about and the cervix actually opens and then it dilates again, like it actually closes off again. Now that's an emotional response. Like I know for me, I was in like active labor, like labor was going, 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 progressing, progressing, got to hospital, everything stopped, like no contractions, nothing. Like it was just over. Like I was like, no. And the midwife said to me, she said, well, what's going on, Eloise? She's, like, she's going to my face. And I just started sobbing. I said, I don't want to be in hospital. I'm scared of being here. I don't like it. And I just, and she said, well, I'll just, and she just let me feel that. I don't think she even said anything. I can't even remember. And I just sobbed, I don't know, for a, for a while. And bam, labor started all up again. And, you know, my fear completely shut down um, that, that. And also, you know, there's often, you know, anger in women about having a child. Some women don't want to do it. You know, they want the man to do everything for them. And if a man can't have a baby, they're not going to either. Um, some women, you know, feel entitled that they shouldn't even have to do a birth. You know, then they have cesareans or, or whatever. Now, I do see a time and a place for cesarean section. And I do see like how medical inf intervention can be wonderfully helpful, particularly when a person is like totally shut down to their emotions. And when there's a baby, now there's two souls. And you as a, a parent want to be selfish and self-absorbed and, you know, not deal with certain things. Well, the baby then suffers at, at, from what you do. And that is a natural result of, of you not dealing with your issues or not being, you know, not working through various things. That, that is something, like that would be, a, you know, an attraction for you or a consequence of you not dealing with your stuff. You know, when I say your stuff, not dealing with the emotions in you that are preventing you from loving more and being truthful. But when there's a baby involved, now there's two people involved. And if you abdicate your decision and you don't want to, you know, if you're just like, no, I don't want to do this or I don't want to give birth or I, I've had enough and I just want it to be over and I don't want to deal with it and, you know, whatever it is. Well, there's also a baby at stake and a baby, you know, a baby's also going through the whole process that you're going through. And a baby can get in, you know, get into trouble quite rapidly um, in the sense of, you know, you might not be able to breathe or complications can happen. Again, that's all an attraction for the parents. And if you haven't dealt with your beliefs and your feelings and all of those things, then, you know, these things do happen. Again, I'm, I am saying you have a responsibility and you are creating the experience that you have. So yeah, it was a really wonderful, I felt very privileged to have this opportunity to see, one, I'd had my own experiences, but obviously seeing someone else's experiences um, helps a lot too. And I had two, like three quite different births. And it was very interesting to reflect back on uh, sort of the feelings and, and emotions I had before the births, like what was happening in my life. The gender of the baby was very interesting too. So though I didn't um, get a scan or ultrasound to know what the gender was, once the baby came out, I could like reflect about the sort of different birth processes. I had two births in hospital and one at home. The one at home was quite different to the ones in hospital, um, which was quite interesting to, to look at. I did trust my body and I knew that it could, could give birth. I had a lot of faith in, in my physical body and knew that if I, I was quite fascinated even when I was having contractions of how all these things were happening to my body and my body was doing it and I didn't even have to do anything. All I had to do was let it happen. And that was a really lovely lesson for me to learn. I was just like, wow, I just have to like let it happen. Um, and I also, the pain of birth, um, I had experienced migraines from when I was quite a young child. And I just remember saying to my husband, I was like, yeah. At the time I was like, this is so much better than a migraine. Like, because it's an intense feeling for, you know, and, there's, and there is like some physical pain at times, but it's gone. And so you get this rest time in a way. And it's, I suppose it reinforces this lovely feeling I have with God of like how God never gives us more than we can handle. And it's sort of like the contraction would take you to sort of almost the point of overwhelm. And then it would sort of like give you a bit of a, a reprieve. And even, you know, when the baby actually is birthed, it comes out and it, there's like, a, it's, it's quite a nice feeling actually. Um, some people, I don't know if they experience that, but it was, it was, it was, it wasn't a hard, it wasn't hard in any way. Um, yeah, it was quite, quite a, 
a very novel experience, but uh, quite a pleasant sensation too, not, not, not unpleasant. So I'm not saying there's not pain in, ch in childbirth, but again, the amount of pain that, that someone has is directly related to what's going on emotionally for them. And the more in denial and the more you shut down your emotions, the more pain there is because, and it, that's the way it works. Because the more denial you're in, then the more physical pain there is because your physical body is like the way, it's like the last, the last point of call, if you like. It's like your soul, there's, there's certain pains or trauma in your soul. If you're not sensitive enough to deal with that there, then it sort of like manifests over time into your physical body. And then you begin to have an ailment that you kind of can't ignore until it comes to a point you can't ignore it. And that's, I feel like the pain pleasure system. It's like one way that God's laws is trying to show you, hey, look, look at all this physical pain you've got going on. There's something wrong in your life. Maybe you should make some different decisions. You're not like accepting certain truths or feeling certain emotions and uh, you're not being loving for whatever reason that, that that physical ailment's in you. And it's often not until something gets physical that we actually take notice of it. I say obviously here. It wasn't obvious to me at the beginning. Um, I have been brought up in a family where natural medicines were, they're very into natural medicines and there, so there is a feeling in me that your body is able to heal and cure illness and that you just let illness run its course and it, it will flow through you. But I didn't have the emotional connection until um, my, my late 20s, early 30s. And now I just, it's like I don't even really take a lot of supplements or I hardly ever take supplements or things like that because I know that there's an emotion in me that is causing, say, the deficiency or whatever else is happening in my body or the illness or the pain or whatever. And if I can find the emotional cause of that thing and work my way through it, the pain will go. And I've had many experiences now that I know that to be true. Um, and so I can see now when it happens to other people, what's going on. And I also can see, like, there's even studies being done, say, um, with physical disease and ailments in the body and people working through emotional trauma and them actually having amazing recovery results. And those have been documented and, and stuff in the medical profession. So there's a lot of interesting information out there. But a lot of um, fear in people as well and anger about doing things. And that's what I'm noticing about um, the younger generation now. There's a lot of anger about giving birth. And I'm just mentioning that because if you're you know, pregnant or having babies, you might feel really angry and about a lot of things. And if you do, grab yourself a punching, you know, get yourself a baseball bat and a punching bag and just whack that bag or scream into your pillow or, you know, whatever works for you. Find your method of expressing your emotion. Um, I found like people would suggest all these things and I'd try and do what they said and it didn't work. I now just explore my, I just trial all kinds of different things and, and just let myself feel. And I give myself permission to just feel however I want to do that uh, in, in a responsible manner. I don't do it, say, in front of the kids or in front of my partner or anything like that. It's, I'm very honest and transparent in front of everybody, but I would take myself off because I, I don't really want to involve other people in my, my actual emotional process. Uh, it doesn't feel that good to me. And it's not they can't really help me in it anyway. I just need to go through it. So yeah, so if you're, you know, even if you get to your birth and you know, you've only just heard this information or um, someone's told you about it or something, you know, if you even write in labor now and someone's saying to you, well, you're creating your own experience and you feel pissed off about that, I suggest go have your tantrum about it. Go have your tantrum. Let yourself feel that. I noticed when I was with this, this friend being her support, support person and, or her and her um, husband's support person, um, I felt that was my role to support both of them. And he, they, both her husband and I, we were just like, let yourself have the, like, let yourself feel what you feel, like, do it. And she chose not to. And that actually then dictated what happened to the, in her labor. And it was amazing. Like um, both her husband and I just, we had sort of a bit of a chat about it and we were just like observing and saying, wow, isn't this amazing? Like what's going on now that she's made this choice? And every choice that she made, you could see then the, um, the, the consequence of that choice. And she just made a series of collective choices which ended up in the end result. And in the end, uh, she had a very, very, very long labor, very, very slow labor. Um, and she ended up having to, um, going into hospital and having a cesarean section because it just got to a point where uh, the baby needed to um, be born and had, you know, it would have compromised the health of the baby not to, to allow baby to come into the world. 
but it was her choice not to actually do it um, vaginally. And that was, it was just such a, yeah, as I said to them, I was like, what a, uh, for me, just such a, a gift and a, an amazing experience to be privileged to that, um, to that birth and to see like just how, how we create those circumstances. Now, with, um, now I've talked a lot about the woman here and, you know, her process and everything, but depending on what kind of relationship with you have with your, your partner, is going to depend on how well you go. Like if you've got certain codependences or worries with your partner and you know they're in the room with you, then that's going to influence your birth too. And if you and that's why I'm sort of encouraging you both to be very honest and open with each other about what you really feel and what you really think and your real beliefs. And one of you might want a home birth and the other one might not. Now, you need to discuss these things before you have a, a baby, you know. Discuss them, have them out, have the conflict. Um, I don't mean like be really nasty to each other. I mean, raise the issues, let the conflict happen in the sense of you let yourself feel whatever you feel about that and your partner feel whatever they feel about that and then go away and work through those issues and then come back and discuss them more and then go back away and feel and then come back and, you know, and that's what I'm talking about, the conflict. Let all of your belief systems be conflicted. Don't just be like, no, I'm doing whatever. It's like sort it out, ask the questions, find out what the real motivation is that you've got the problems or the the concerns or the worries or what do you really think is going to happen? Be honest about those things. If you work through those things, they're highly unlikely to happen. If you never mention them and you're in denial of them, there's more higher chance that they might happen. Yeah, just, just well worth being you know, like a real example of being truthful, transparent and open and honest. It also is the best thing that you can do for your child because then you have the least, um, the least amount of suppressed kind of emotion is going to be heading your child's way and your child can then um, not be impacted or bombarded by all of the denial that you have going on. Because remember, any denied emotion or unhealed emotion that you have with inside you, you know, your child is going to reflect back to you. That means the child is experiencing that, like they're feeling that, and then they're responding to that um, in order that you have the opportunity to grow in love. So probably by now in this um, presentation, you can see that from uh, like based on the premise of what I'm saying that, you know, you, you are creating the experience you have and just encouraging you to be more truthful and transparent with your partner and, and yourself during pregnancy. And again, you can do this alone or if you've got a partner, you can do it either way. And also you're going to create the situation and what the attractions that are going to happen. That also goes for any midwives you have and the doctors that you attract and all of the things that are said to you. If you're humble to just taking, you know, reflecting on yourself and when you get certain feedback or information, how do you feel about all of that information? What are your real thoughts and feelings on it? And you let yourself work through the feelings you have. Um, it's amazing what happens. Like I've had friends who have had illnesses or been with babies and they've had an experience at first say with a, a midwife and it's been quite um, confrontational they haven't liked it or they've gone oh I don't like that at all sometimes that you know felt felt some things like I know for myself I there was one midwife who I met who I um, went home to my ex-husband said no I don't I don't want it I hope she's not at the birth at all because and she was telling me about all these intervention processes and all these things that would have to happen if certain things happened or didn't happen and how I should be going to an obstetrician and I should be this and I should be that and all of this stuff. And they were all things that like sort of freaked me out and I remember just crying, crying, crying through these things and being all worried and upset. And it was really interesting because um, when I first got to the hospital with her first child and we had a set of midwives who were really lovely, they were just so supportive, they just said to... Um, uh, my mum was there at the time and she said afterwards to me, she said, oh, and I think actually my, my ex also said it as well, she said, they just said, oh, this, this lady's fine, like just let her naturally birth, like she's, she doesn't need any, any help, like it's going fine. And anyway, they had to swap shifts, so their, their shift came to an end and they left. And in walked this woman who I'd had all these conversations with and she'd been the one who was telling me all this stuff that I'd felt terrible about and all these things. And she was amazing. She, she was so wonderful. Like, it was like she was a completely different person. Or really, let me say, we had a completely different experience with her because no longer did I have all of these, um, 
like feelings in me towards her or about the things that she'd been talking to me about. And I also knew, like, you know, now that it's sort of birthing, I was sort of confident and it was all going all fine and things like this. But it was because I'd worked through certain things before the birth that I feel that it actually happened that way. She ended up yeah, being a very, very good midwife and I actually really enjoyed it. But my point was that sometimes like the attraction, if you work through certain things, then there can be a very different experience with exactly the same person um, in, a different, you know, in a different situation or sometime later when you see them. So having a baby, I feel, is such a, uh, a wonderful experience for, both, for, for, for all parties involved in, in that. So it's a very unique experience and I, uh, each birth is completely different. So I know there's a lot of birthing stories out there. And I don't know if, if you are pregnant or you've, you, know, you and your partner have, it speak to people. I attracted a lot of people telling me a lot of very, very negative things about birth and a lot of like horror stories almost and all of these things. And I was like, man, like why would anyone want to have a baby if it's like this? And I know from my own experience, it's not like that. It, it's just, it's not. The reason why it's like that with the, you know, the knowledge that I now have and reflecting on th having three children, like three natural births and reflecting on various different people who I've met and them being quite honest about their experiences with having babies and things like that. I can absolutely see how your unhealed emotions, you know, condition and your belief systems 100% impact the birth that you have. So as I was saying, you create your own experiences and that's not just in birth, that's in everything. So you're a partnership with you and your partner and there's a little soul who's going to come into the world if you're, if you're, having a, if you're pregnant and having a little baby. And for the best interest of in bubs, deal with your, own, with your own issues. You're the parent, you're the responsible one, you're the one who's got some information about the world. You know, you're the adult in this relationship and you're the parent in this relationship. And I do feel it's a responsibility of a parent to deal with anything in them that's out of harmony with love so that they don't pass that on to the gener next generation. Sometimes we don't take up that responsibility and we choose not to do that and we choose not to love and we have the free will to do that. But do understand that there's a consequence on the child when we don't do that. And that child is then left with a legacy of emotions and a legacy of belief systems and a legacy of all kinds of unhealed emotion. And, well, you know, basically we dump a whole, it's like kind of like taking a massive backpack of our rubbish or all of our collected unhealed emotional experiences that we never felt when we were children. And then we've acted upon those and then we've created more things and then we've made decisions and then we've taken actions and all of that stuff we, we keep with us and we haven't released that emotionally. We haven't made the change we haven't let it flow through us and we've just kept acting kept acting to to where we are then a little baby comes in it's sort of like both the parties take their back we still have it and we sort of like copy our backpack dump it on them and then depending on the nature and the personality of the child depending on then the decisions we make as a parent when that child is very small depends on how much um, they they absorb because say if you've suddenly heard this or you've been listening to the teachings of divine truth for a while and you've gone, oh, yep, okay, I, I've got to work through my own issues and I want to be more truthful, I want to be more loving and your intention changes and your aspiration is to love and a lot of good things can happen and God can help you in that space and, um, you know, you, there's beautiful spirit influence that can help you and your baby um, in, the, in those positions, you know. The power of prayer is a very, very powerful, beautiful, um, beautiful gift. That, that we have and a, a wonderful mechanism that we can use in order to connect with our creator and also to help us to learn more about ourselves and become more loving and more truthful people. Yeah, I've covered, you know, thinking about being pregnant, being pregnant, having a baby, going through the birth and, you know, just to summarize the key points there is really come to know who you really are, see yourself warts and all, so suggest to do that before you have a child like spend some time self-reflecting and know who you are but again these things happen and often it's not till we have children that we actually start a process of self-reflection or even even reviewing ourselves like we are pretty selfish people most of the time not saying all or everyone it's that's a bit of a blanket statement but as a general rule a lot of us are very very selfish um, 
when it comes to, to ourselves and then having children. We make a lot of selfish decisions, I should say, that are about our own, what we see as our own self-preservation or preventing our own feelings rather than actually doing what love would do. And I'm talking about love from God's perspective because often as parents we genuinely think we are doing the loving thing. There are certain areas where I reflect back and I know that I was not doing the loving thing and they're pretty obvious and, and I think if you just stop for a couple of minutes pretty much everyone on the planet, you know, would have a sense that, wow, no, there's some things that are really not good. But there are some other things that because of the way that we've been brought up ourselves or certain emotional injuries we have or certain belief systems we have, we do actually genuinely think we're doing loving things. We do. We've been, we, we feel like they are. But this is where, you know, learning, getting an education from God's perspective about what love is comes to put into perspective of, of what love really is. And you can have personal truth and how you feel about something in your partner. You can have personal truth and how they feel about something and what the truth is of what's happened to us in our lives like collectively. But then there's God's truth. And God's truth is, for me personally, what I want to aim for. And that's always what I'm aiming for. I don't claim to be there all the time. I don't claim to understand it all the time. I'm just learning and I aspire to that place because that's the absolute truth of something. And that can help you to know, is it loving? Is it not loving? So if you've got God's truth and you're both working towards God's truth, that means your partner and you working to God's truth, then your aspiration can go really good. Now, you might just have one party wanting to do God's truth and the other one doesn't want to do anything at all. That's still going to help the child. Um, obviously, a child inherits things from both parties. So if one party doesn't do it, then they're going to have issues from that party. But you still can have a positive influence, even if only one party is seeking for that that absolute truth from God. Um, I feel that in relationships, the absolute truth is really what, if you aim for that, then so many things get sorted out automatically. It's when we get all defensive about our own, you know, holding on to what we think is right and being righteous about what we believe and what we want and what's right for us and how we're being hurt and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, playing the blame game, you know, making it someone else's problem, not wanting to take responsibility. Those are all the issues that cause a lot of pain and suffering in relationships. So the more we can work through those, the better it becomes. So then that brings me to newborns. If you've been through the whole process of conceiving a child and then well, having sex and then conceiving a child and then <laughs> uh, going through pregnancy and having a baby, then now there's a newborn. Uh, you may have just adopted a little newborn or someone who's very, very young and new to the world. Or you may be just looking after someone as a foster child or there's many different, different ways that you could be um, involved with a little newborn life and child. So if you're at this stage, then there's um, the same principle applies of feeling your emotions and being truthful and transparent and do you desire to love and measuring everything you do really against those things. Now, a ch little newborn, because now they're out of the womb, they're now going to start expressing themselves and they're starting to learn things and absorb things from the world like they've already been absorbing while they're inside um, a mother's um, tummy and they've already been absorbing everything from their environment anyway. But now they're outside and so, you know, they've got their own body and everything is new for them. It's like this wonderful newness of, I, I feel, it's such a, such a wonder. Like I understand like why, you know, people just watch their little, like their babies just for hours and hours and hours and I know for... <laughs> for us I don't think it was all loving <laughs> but there was but parts of it were just it was so fascinating you know I was like oh look at this look at that look at that and I remember when the baby has the first meconium sort of poo and it's like you've done its first poo you know and, the, and having a wee and you know got, got on us and everyone's like oh wow you know if, if an adult kind of weed and you'd probably be quite disgusted but it's like the first time that your child's had a wee or whatever its body's working it's a wonderful thing I kind of like, uh, just remembering it, I find it a little bit amusing of just how just wondrous these things are. And then some of the things that, the very things that I just thought were, were so amazing. Then when they're sort of like happening as, as the child gets older or whatever, and then, you know, I, I don't know, whatever my emotions were about that, how unimpressed I was about certain things and I didn't like them and I didn't want it to happen. So just the contrast of, of different feelings that I had, I was just sort of thinking about. Which amuses me but yeah a newborn baby is just like this little reflecting barometer they're just responding 
24 seven to the environment. So if you feel angry or stressed or upset or uh, sad and you're not feeling it and you're not working through it, your child will be reflecting that and they, they may end up with certain physical problems that like they may get really windy or colic or various other things. Um, or they, and they may cry, you know, so crying is a way that a child can express itself. It's sort of the way that it's, it's uh, saying, hey, you know, I'm hungry. Hey, I've got a wet nappy. Hey, I'm uncomfortable. Or, or man, this is an uncomfortable environment to be in. You guys are really sad. It's obviously not thinking that. It's not self-aware. It's not even recognized, like, it's not having an intellectual thought. It's just feeling and responding. That's what babies do. They just feel and respond. But it can it be an indicator to you, the parents, to learn a lot about love. If you actually like own your own emotion and actually feel your own emotion, you'll find that the baby actually will stop crying. So if you hit on the actual thing the baby's reflecting to you, you will stop crying, like it will completely stop crying. Um, and my friends, as an example, who have had the baby, they both uh, uh, relayed some experiences where um, the little one's dad actually, he, he said he, he just was like, the baby was sort of fussy and he, and he the dad, was feeling like, like a bit worried and not sure if he could cope very well and, and then baby was like a bit fussy with eating and all this kind of thing and fussing and staying awake and he was just so tired and he just said he, he put babe down safely and he went off away and he just got really angry, just like let his rage out about all kinds of different things and I won't go into the details of it, but he just expressed his feelings away from baby and, and you know, in a loving manner and um, he went back and baby was just like totally ate, full, full feed, sleep. And was just like, like no more. And, and he was just like, it was just so amazing. You know, like I just had to be real about what he was feeling. And even as he was holding him at first, you know, he was starting to connect to the fact, no, I'm really angry. And he was letting himself feel that. And as soon as he started connecting to his real emotional feelings, baby just started quietening down because baby no longer was, had to have the job of reflecting it. As parents, when we don't take responsible for our own feelings and what we're actually really truly feeling, we're then making someone else responsible for it. And that is a fact. Like if you don't deal with your stuff, you make other people responsible for it. If you don't take responsibility for your own issues and your own emotions and your own feelings and all of those, then they're all going to go out to the wider world and other people are going to have to be on the receiving end of them. Personally, I don't feel like that's a very loving thing to do, but that is what happens if we choose not to, to deal with it. If those people who are around you loved you, they'd just point that out to you and say, hey, you know, you're making me responsible for your feelings again and I don't want to do that and that's not a loving thing to do. What are you going to do about it? And that's the opportunity that, you know, we have. You don't have to do something for another person. So say I have certain feelings and I'm not dealing with them. You know, a loving provision is to, to point them out if, if that opportunity exists and it's there. Now, particularly in a partnership, um, you know, if, if you know your partner, you, know, you get to know your partner pretty well. And for instance, if you have a sulky partner, a partner who, when something they don't like happens, they start sulking. Well, it's a good thing to say, yeah, you're just sulking now because you don't like what I said. Now, often partners will try and placate more. They do the sulking because they get what they want. So in our family, sulking meant that I tried harder to make them feel better and to pick up the pieces. So they, so now the kids and, and my ex-husband, they do sulking. And I'd then work harder and harder and harder to try and get them out of the sulkingness because it made me feel so bad. Now I just go off and I feel how I feel about someone sulking or I've worked through enough and I just say, to them, well, you're just sulking, so I'm still not gonna do what you want. And I head off and do what I want and then they sulk until they realize that I'm really not gonna do what they want and then they stop sulking. So it's a very, a very good way to, to do things. With a children is different than a partner. So with, a, with children, because you, the parent, have created the environment that they're in, because you have actually literally given them inheritance of um, you know, unloving emotional injuries and, and things like that, it's a different relationship. You have a responsibility for the creation and what the, the unloving creations that have occurred in the children. And you do have a responsibility to correct those. With a partner, You've already met them. You both come into a relationship with a whole heap of baggage from your own childhoods. And it's really just a, a lovely opportunity to work through your stuff. Like your partner will have some things probably that you're in codependence with, but it'll have some things that probably really annoy you. And those things are wonderful because you can actually then start to say, wow, why do I feel so angry about this thing? And it'll be nothing really to do with your partner. 
It will be due to something in your past that you have not worked through and have not dealt with and your partner is just exposing that in you and it's up to you to then deal with it. And it's an opportunity to do so. And that's the beauty of having relationships and having an intimate romantic partner relationship because, you know, and I suggest doing that with your soulmate. But, you know, if you don't, if you're in a relationship or, or already, I think you can do it, do it with them. Like I, I sometimes feel quite sad about, uh, yeah, the fact of, you know, what happened in my, in my own relationship is that there was such an opportunity to actually work through things. And um, it's not together. It's because I can't do something for my partner and they can't do something for me. I have to feel my own feelings. But there is this lovely opportunity to, you know, work through sexual issues and work through relationship and romantic issues. And it's a different type of relationship when you're in a partnership or a romantic relationship than it is in a friendship. So there's a lot you can work through in a friendship, but some things will just have to wait for a soulmate, you know. Or um, Again, if you don't think you're with your soulmate, I still honestly recommend working through everything in the relationship that you're in right now. Or if you've just left a relationship... Work through everything that was happening in that relationship because all those things, if you don't deal with them now, you'll take into the next relationship with you. And that's, it's sort of like, you know, we're talking about the, uh, in another presentation, it's like this glass half full or, or pouring in emotion and you have to pour out emotion in order to be able to accept or receive new truth and, and accept and receive love. And, or well, God's love can actually pour into you and then it will also expel the error that, through an emotional process. I can't remember where I was going with that point, but I'll, um, I'll come back to it if I remember. As a newborn, you'll also you have new things happening like having milk and coming through your breasts and feeding and all of that will bring up a whole lot of in, um, feelings as well. I know do the different gender children, that was really interesting for me. With our daughter, I felt very differently than with our sons, and I chose to do very different things with them as well, which highlighted, um, particularly in hindsight, just a lot of issues that I had with you know, women in contrast to men, and the demands and expectations I had from that I wanted from men in contrast to what I had with women. So I had a feeling that as a woman, women are quite capable, competent, they should just get on, do things, they need to get independent as fast as possible, just get on with life and, and do it. No, that's kind of how I um, feel about myself and sort of what I was, what I did. And I have that feeling like, nope, totally can do it. Well, was with men, because my relationship with my dad, or from my relationship with my dad, is what originated. But then I, from things that I developed as I got older of what I wanted, as I acted on those things, I wanted, a, I like wanted to give all these things to men in order to get a whole lot of things back. And so I had a very different attitude towards the boys and um, our daughter. And that was quite interesting just to see then, yeah, what then played out when I hadn't actually, like I was, you know, I was in denial of those emotions. And then, you know, still, I'm still working through a lot of those different things. I know for me, I had um, mastitis with, when, with, our first, with our first child. And I feel like a lot of that for me was about rage of actually, you know, feeding our child and, I definitely had some anger, about, like a lot of anger actually, um, to, that I hadn't dealt with before having a child. And that was then, you know, our poor, our, our little daughter had reflected that back and she also was absorbing all of that from me because I wasn't dealing with that in a very, in a very loving way. So, yeah, that's like an inheritance that now she's got and I realised that that was not loving on my part and I'd like to correct that as I, I go ahead. But all of these things influenced what happened both to my body physically and also then the interaction, you know, the interrelationship with my ex-husband and I and also our relationship with, our, with the children who came into our care. And, yeah, like having children just throws everything under the microscope. Like, but if you don't want to look at it, you know, all kinds of things happen. Like, I feel like that's what postnatal depression is about is I feel like I had that with some of our kids and I feel it's that it's just the suppression of emotion not wanting to feel what comes up and you know wanting just to suppress down all the emotions that are exposed by this little person who comes into your house and you no longer have sleep and you're really sleep deprived and you know sometimes you know you don't necessarily care for yourself that well and all of the, the things in your relationship that were already not very good, but that you could kind of skip over before you had children, 
they all get exposed because now you're tired and you both, you know, sometimes you both don't want to get up and do a feed or, you know, you don't want to change, a, your partner might not want to change a nappy or you might not want to change a nappy and all of these, uh, like your, your angers and your sadnesses and your fears and all kinds of stuff comes up. And then, you know, if your child gets an illness, you know, or they come, you know, they're born with some kind of disease or something, then there's a whole lot of, or condition, you know, there's all of those things to deal with. And all of those, like a, in a newborn baby, if it's born with a, a, a disease or a condition or something wrong with it, that is an attraction for you and your partner. And sometimes it's actually multi-generational, like it's a familial, maybe a familial issue, like a, a something, a disease that comes through and there can be a lot of spirit influence involved in that as well, which is a whole nother discussion. All of these things, you need, if you take some, you know, look at yourself and take some responsibility yourself and look at, okay, what in me has created this? You can find out a lot of different things very rapidly. And if you are humble enough to work through the issue that you have inside yourself that caused the attraction of the disease or the um, ailment or the you know, condition in the child, there is potential, depending on what it is, for it to be healed because it's not something that the child has created or, um, you know, from their own actions. It is, it can be healed. And I don't know anyone who's done that yet, but I do feel it's possible. Yeah, it just depends on, on the humility of the parent and, the, and not just that, the desire to love uh, um, and to actually know what's going on. Most often parents just sort of then just go into mode of trying to correct the child rather than correcting their own soul and what happened. I know for us, you know, our kids had a lot of childhood diseases such as, you know, whooping cough and they got a lot of colds and, um, and sort of infect chest infections and things like that. And there's a lot of suppressed sadness there was in our family and that's a lot to do with, you know, when you have sort of lung issues or colds and things like that. And even now they're still, uh, particularly the boys actually, uh, suppressing a lot of their sadness um, and the dad does that as well so they're still reflecting that in, in our environment and I know for myself if I don't if I have um, something that I feel sad about come up and I don't feel my sadness pretty much within like 15 minutes I'll have some kind of congestion happening over over that time depending on my level of resistance will depend how bad it gets um, I've had like throat abscesses and all kinds of, of things like that so and all of those I can directly link to denial of emotion and as I get out of the, it's resi and it's the resistance almost that cause the, causes the illness, I feel. It's like the resistance to the truth. It's, it's not wanting it. As soon as, you know, I'm accept more accepting of the truth, then often the um, ailment clears up quite rapidly. Like, so I can get a cold in 15 minutes and it can also be gone the next day. Um, if I have, you know, if I actually have a cry or when I say I'm having a cry, when I feel the grief I have about what's going on. Sorry, I sometimes use these slang terms like have a cry or feel your emotion or whatever, but it's far more specific than that. It's not as generalized. It's just, I suppose, I'm so used to doing it now that I, um, yeah, forgive me for sometimes not being as, um, I need to tease things out a little bit more if this is the first time you've ever, ever heard what I, like these things, these concepts that I'm saying. In light of that, it would be that you'd need to feel your sense. So say your child Say our child then, you know, develops symptoms of having a cough or a chest infection or something. Now I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, their dad or I denying an emotion. Okay, what in me? And even if, you know, and I know, well, for both of us, you know, there's, there's areas where we're not feeling our grief and we're not releasing it. So it applies to both of us. And generally it's like that, you know, but it might be a different thing in each partner. It might not be the same, exact same thing. There's a lot to it, a lot you can learn from having children, and I think it's a beautiful, beautiful gift and a lovely experience to have. Uh, there's also, I was going to note that there are millions of children who would benefit so greatly from being loved, and having your, having to have your own child, though that's an experience and it is a beautiful experience, and I, I think it's a lovely experience to go through. It's not a necessity, you know, there are, there are millions and millions and millions of children in the world who would, as I said, benefit so much from a loving home. And if there's the opportunity to look after someone else's child rather than your own, you know, maybe that's okay. And I, I feel it's like, you know, if you have a child and, I mean, one, you do have to ask yourself the question, like, if, if we're going to have sex, there's a potential of having a child. 
So we do need to get a little bit more like uh, responsible about the fact that, okay, if I have sex, I've got to be responsible enough that I'm going to have a baby. And no, a condom or the pill or, you know, some contraceptive method that doesn't prevent you from necessarily having a baby. It is a good precaution to take because sex is fun. It is enjoyable. It's a pleasurable experience. Um, it's not to not have sex, but beware that having sex is the way that a baby's made. You could have a baby and that is your responsibility. If you're responsible enough to have sex, then you need to be responsible enough to have a baby and take that into consideration um, before you do. There's lots of sexual things you can do with a partner without actually literally having intercourse and that would prevent you from you know, getting pregnant. It's the only way you're going to prevent from being pregnant. <laughs> uh, so it's all fun and games while you're having sex. It's all another story when you start having a whole lot of babies. So I do, I do uh, suggest that you, yeah, you, you really think about that before you go around having sex. And it's important to talk to kids as well and, and make them aware of their responsibilities and, and the possibilities and the facts of, of what happens. Um, our kids are quite hilarious. They've been quite curious about sex and, and stuff for a long time. And there's been an attraction when they're very little to help uh, me and, and their dad to work through certain issues that we had around sex and sexuality. But also, yeah, just sort of exploring. And I, I find I'm not so worried about talking about sex and myself. And so we've had some really great conversations, the kids and I, about it, because they've obviously read, um, I've had sort of certain books um, that I've, you know, had, and they were looking through my stuff once and found a book on orgasms. And <laughs> on, I think it was called The Female Orgasm or something. And they were like, what's an orgasm? And uh, so I explained to them what it was and, and said, well, why don't you look it up? And then they found like, you know, other words like contraceptive or condom and all these other things. I'm like, what are those? So I got them to look that up as well on the internet um, and, then, and then discussed it with them. And we actually ended up getting a, you know, I got them a pack of condoms so that they could play with them. And they made like water babies and I think they trialed them out and all these kind of things. And they're like, what do you do with these kind of things? They made them into balloons and stuff like that. And it was actually really fun and quite um, funny as well and they were quite in, like just adorable with what they did and they ended up making condom babies and so they filled them with water and then got a little tea towel and put them in a little bow in, um, in a little basket and sort of like <laughs> took them around places but what was quite lovely about the experience is that they don't have I know they don't really have much shame now about you know condoms and and I hope that I hope that they don't get any as they get older from their peer, peers um, and they also know, you know, that it's contraceptive and they know the facts about, about what's going on. And the natural curiosity led them to, to that, which was, quite, which was quite lovely. And we've talked about pregnancy and birth and, you know, um, STIs that you can get. So, um, and just to be aware about those things. And we, but I talk about those in the context of relationships and about soulmates and about not having sex with somebody who doesn't love you or who you don't love or just doing it because everyone else has or... You know, we've got a lot of sexual injuries in our, in our life and in our world at large and a lot of misconceptions about love and sex and a lot of the time sex isn't even connected with love and I feel like that's a very sad thing. That was an experience that I had, you know, some of the partners that I've had in the past and, yeah, I don't recommend that and I, I wish differently for our children but I also know that unless I work through the issues that I have in myself about sexuality and sex that our children have, have got those beliefs and feelings within them as well. And so I do find it fascinating talking to them about relationships and I've asked them about, you know, who they think their soulmate is and do they want a soulmate and, you know, what gender they think their soulmate is and what kind of relationship they think they'd like in the future and how they'd like to um, interact with men and women. And some of the things they say are quite enlightening. They're quite interesting. So it's, um, I suppose I'm saying, you know, you can talk to children about these things. It doesn't need to be a graphic, explicit um, sharing of all your intimate partner experiences. I'm not really into that. I feel that's a bit inappropriate for them uh, to go into that detail. But again, as they get older, I would definitely share certain um, principles or lessons that I learned from various interactions or relationships that I've had in order to teach them something about love or, or truth or I know, say, for instance, my daughter has inherited various beliefs about herself and about gender and, and women and what the role of a woman is. And as she gets older, like already she's asking certain questions about some things. And we have quite frank discussions about 
the roles of, of women and men in relationships and how, how, you know, what's expected of them. And she's expressing to me, like, you know, I'm more than a body mum. You know, people are looking at, you know, she's developing now in her body. And she came home one day and was quite upset because someone had been sort of looking at her chest and not talking to her. And she's like, my eyes are up here, mum, my eyes are up here. And those are things she's inherited from me. There's like certain feelings now that I can see, wow, yep, she's going to go through some similar things that I went through. Um, because I hadn't healed those injuries when she, before she was born or when she was very small. And now they're playing out in her life. Yeah, there's a lot of education and sometimes, look, it can feel overwhelming and sometimes, you know, it doesn't feel so great when you see what you've really created. But I think that you just need to feel through that, you know, just, just feel it and let yourself feel that because that's an indicator and a feedback system that, you know, for me, I wasn't very loving. I, I wasn't, um, I was quite, you know, selfish about that. I didn't want to deal with those feelings at that time. And now this is the compensation in a way for that and she, our daughter's going to need to work through that herself if she chooses to and I, I can't take that away from her now and that's a big lesson for me of, of going wow like all right you know I feel now quite serious about dealing with a lot more different things again there's some things that I don't see about myself and so I haven't dealt with those and you know as I see them I'll probably have the same response and the same, a similar feeling in order to work through them. But the more that we can work through and, you know, simultaneously as we have young children or before we have children, it's, you know, it's wonderful. And as I was saying, you know, be aware, having sex and you know, have a baby, are you up for that responsibility? It is a responsibility of both parties. It's not just um, the woman's role or just the man's role. It's both parties. And I do realise now like men are often taking over a greater care of children at times in some relationships. If you're the the sort of the main provider, the primary provider, and your wife's off, um, you know, doing other things or she's off working or whatever, then you're going to have a whole lot of things going on with this child. And so the same applies to, to you as the dad. You know, feel all of these things. I've, I've been talking about both relationships, but I suppose now specifically just saying, you know, to dads, let yourself feel your emotions, let yourself experience what it feels like and the joy of interacting with your children or child, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things you can learn about love and develop there and, and teach your, ch your child. And I encourage both, you know, if you've got both partners, you know, mum and a dad, then I feel like it's, um, uh, well, everyone's got a mum and a dad, but you know, you might have two dads or two mums. And um, it's good to be able though, to have role model of, you know, what a loving male figure is and what a loving female figure is. And I feel there's a lot of distortions about love, both in both genders in our world. And being truly feminine and being truly masculine, gosh, we have a lot of distortion about that. And I can't talk extensively about that myself. I'm only, I feel like um, I'm just sort of seeing a lot of the error or the things that are wrong about that, you know, like expecting men to be tough and unemotional. Well, that doesn't feel to me like what real masculinity is. I feel like um, real masculinity and, you know, real men, they're going to cry. They do. They're going to express their emotion. They're going to feel how they feel. They're going to be expressive of that and passionate and, you know, um, expressive and honest and open and truthful and being who they are and probably quite kind and gentle and, you know, um, that, but that doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're not a man. It's like, it's a wonderful quality to develop, but there's a lot of often condescension or, or pulling down of men who express, express those, you know, those softer sides of themselves. And I, I feel like that's a real disservice that we're doing to our sons and to our brothers and to our, um, you know, partners and, and everybody really. Yeah, it comes, I suppose, from our parents, so, but everyone else you're involved in. And I feel it's important that when, you know, any partner or anybody in your life does, a, you know, does the right thing or the good thing to really reward and acknowledge that, you know, acknowledge, wow, that's a really lovely thing you did. So, you know, uh, um, and for, for all of us, I'm, because we're talking about men expressing themselves, it's like, let, let a little boy feel his emotions. Let him fall over and have a cry. Let him, you know, feel how sad he feels when something happens in his life. Allow him the, the emotional expression. Give him the opportunity to explore his own emotions and his feelings. Let him, you know, express his artistic side as well as, 
you know, maybe other, other things that he wants to do. Allow those experience, you know, let him be express his creativity and, and all of those things, just as you would, you know, and just exactly the same for a little girl, you know, and, and let her as well explore what it means to be self-responsible and say looking after herself and digging holes and playing in the dirt and, you know, doing things that are generally men's roles because there's not, it's not really that way. Like I feel like uh, men and women or masculinity and femininity complement each other and we have different um, just different natures and different personalities but, but it's individual to each soul it's not just a female or a masculine thing and I feel a lot of these things are like well females do this and males do this it's like that's not true that's just the injured way that the world functions and works at the moment and we need to change the way that we look and see the world and if we're going to see it as God sees it. And it's what we have now will be very, very different. And I, I, I suspect that it's going to be almost like complete, like probably unimaginable to us now what God's version of, of what the world really is like, like in the sense of if we love as God loves and, you know, we're loving and truthful in this world. Yeah, sometimes I try and imagine it. Um, and I already know that, it's like living in a different reality sometimes for myself when I'm, when I'm speaking now sometimes to people because what I used to feel and think about certain issues or situations or ways of doing things, I just am in complete disagreement with now because they just don't feel right. You know, they, they don't feel even logical anymore, whereas in the past I would have been in total agreement. So it's just an interesting change when you make some soul-based shifts in yourself so those also, you know, expand out into the wider world. But I think we've sort of come to the end of this um, presentation. In summary, just as an encouragement to reflect and find out, you know, what you really like, how you really feel, who you truly are right now, this moment, warts and all, just, just looking at yourself and how that would have a positive impact as you become a parent. Also covered just some, you know, sort of self-reflecting and encouraging you to, to connect with your partner and be open and transparent and improve the relationship so you have a close, connected, truth and love-based relationship rather than a, um, you know, barter or controlled, you know, based relationship that is about codependence and addictions. Giving up our addictions is the best thing we could do ever in the whole world. It would make the greatest amount of difference both to the natural environment and to our fellow humans and to children in our care. It's something that we need to stop fostering in ourselves and stop modeling to children and not accept in ourselves or in others. Um, it's a very, very damaging thing that we do is all of this emotional addiction engagement that we do. So yeah, just um, talk to sort of just about, you know, different things that might come up in pregnancy, not extensively, just as a few issues. You can apply like what I said and those, those generalized questions to, you know, to reflect on in your own life with your own feelings that you've got, your own thoughts that are coming up. He also just touched on how the body is a natural, naturally designed, perfectly designed to um, birth a baby and any, any reason that there's any complications or things that stop that process is absolutely about the emotional issues that are not being felt, that are being you know, resisted or in denial or uh, not being released in in the mum and and the partner possibly depending on what's happening and how during labor you could actually be going through an emotional process and releasing emotion as your you know body is coming ready to to give birth then we just touched about um, newborns and how they're reflecting their environment and a lot of um, how you can do the experiment of when your child is crying to figure out what in you is going on, like particularly if their nappies change, they're fed and they're not hungry and stuff because sometimes they literally just need a feed and sometimes they've got a wet nappy and they're uncomfortable. But if those things are taken care of, you know, and the baby's been burped and doesn't have wind and things like that, even that's an attraction for mum and dad. But, um, you know, if all those things and the baby's just crying and crying and crying, look to yourselves first and, and sometimes just pause maybe and, and feel how you feel when your baby's like that. I know for me it was like really... Um, I just wanted to stop the crying. That's what I felt with our first child. I just wanted to stop the crying. So I would do pretty much anything to do that. I, I, with our third child, I experimented more 
and I know with now with um, young children who, who sometimes I have interactions with, I just let them cry and I just feel what I feel. Even if I'm not their parent, I'm like, all right, well, how do I feel about this and what's going on for me? And then I also try and feel the parent as well to see if I can maybe help them to, you know, or the parents, if there's two of them, of what's really going on. And I've noticed even sometimes having discussions with parents and saying, well, hold on, what's really going on? How do you feel about that? Or, or we were just talking about, and then I, you know, reflect back, say maybe a conversation that we were in the middle of, and then suddenly the baby started crying. And often when, you know, we reflect those things back, and this happened to me as well, when our Jesus and Mary actually reflected back to me certain things that were going on, and then our children would go sort of wild or act out, that I came to quite rapidly see this connection between myself and the baby. And as soon as I uh, like connected to like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I feel whatever, the baby would quieten down and, and no longer be crying or, or, or whatever was going on. So, yeah, it's just an experiment you can do um, and work through certain issues that you have when that happens. So, and then we also just talked about any um, physical things that you're having. So if you've got any issues breastfeeding or different things going on in your body or, um, you know, or your child has any illnesses or ailments or things, how there's an attraction as well for the parent to deal with an issue as well, um, to see how they are responsible for that creation in the child particularly as a little newborn, that that's a whole new soul. And so they're being just influenced by you. Now, they're, and I really briefly just mentioned, just there's also spirit influence, and we haven't really gone into a discussion of that, but that is a that can also create a lot of different things happening um, in, the, to, in the child's life and in their physical bodies and things like that. But again, it's an attraction for the parents because there can be no spirit influence if the parent wasn't open to those things and if a parent isn't open to spirit influence then their child is also protected from spirit influence so the same principles apply is it's about you the parent dealing with any issues that you have that are out of harmony with love and the more that you can work through and release and get rid of out of yourself the better your life is going to be and your children also are going to have a far more uh, enjoyable experience in their life and far less pain that they have to deal with as they get older or, or even in, in childhood, depending on what your decisions are and what kind of environment you uphold. I realise there's, again, a lot in that that could be unpacked and we could have many, many discussions on, on uh, pregnancy, birth and babies. And I think we have some more. I'll, I'll make some more videos in the future. I feel this one's come to uh, a nice time to close on this one and um, yeah, I suppose lastly we were just talking sort of about having sex and being if you have sex you need to be responsible to have a child and I think if you have that thought and you think about it it would uh, cut out some of the people you have sex with because I know that um, in my own experience and with many people I've talked they're like yeah I wouldn't want to have a child with that person so if you wouldn't have want to have a child with them why are you just trying to get a sexual fix it's not loving to the person you're you're using to to have sex with and um, it also is highlighting that, you know, you're, you're wanting something without taking full responsibility for it. It's not that you're going to get pregnant every time you have sex, you know, it doesn't happen. Though that's what I did think when I was, <laughs> when I was younger. But you, if there is that potential. And so, you know, we just had, I just was mentioning some things about, yeah, looking at your relationships and is your relationship just based on sex or is it actually based on something greater than that? Like, do you want a friendship with this person and to get to know them and to really understand who they are and find out if they're your soulmate or not. Um, you know, it's damaging for us to go sleeping around with many people when they're not our soulmates and it damages our own, our own soulmate relationship as well as the other, other persons who, who we're interacting with. Um, that's a whole other discussion, uh, one that I can't speak as an authority on yet. I'm only beginning my process of discovery. So I can only speak to a certain level of um, opening up to having a desire for one soulmate. Anyway, as I said, another subject, and that's going a bit off tangent. So that brings me to the end of this presentation on pregnancy, birth, and babies, um, the introductory presentation. And um, if you are uh, thinking of having a child, or you are pregnant, or you're about to have a baby, or you've got a newborn, I wish you all the best and, and experimenting with those things. And, yeah, it's well worth making the effort to become a more loving, truthful parent. And um, 
applying some of the, the principles that will be in this, this parenting principles resource, you can use those in your everyday life to experiment and trial out what I'm saying. And it will make your experience smoother and more enjoyable um, with your child. Um, yeah, I, I have some regrets about uh, the way that I parented our first, particularly our first child and first and second child. And, you know, I always feel like I could do better in many, many ways. But just when you focus on love and you get through the period of time where you feel like things are really hard and too much and you sort of get through the selfishness of, of not dealing with your stuff, uh, then a lot of wonderful, wonderful things can happen. So all the best with it. Any questions or queries, feel free to contact me and um, might be some inspiration for some, some other videos based on these topics. For more information on, I know I mentioned abortion, miscarriage, and also on, there's some extensive, uh, with some videos on parents and children relationships on the Divine Truth website. So that's at divinetruth.com. So for more information, go there. There's also some links to pertinent videos or material that you can recommend and watching and viewing that come as a package with this video. So until the next presentation, I wish you all the best and uh, see you then.